Welcome, welcome, welcome. Make sure you are coming in. Make sure you are getting note ready. We were going to get started in just a couple of minutes. Thank you for being on time. Thank you for being early. Early and on time, I should say. Welcome, welcome. Key terms are up. Objective is up. About three minutes before we start. Good afternoon, Jonathan. Day's been all right. Hopefully yours has been well too. How's yours been? About two minutes before we start. Yeah, internet school. Yeah, yeah, I feel that online school. Yeah. Hey, but we work with what we got, right? Last class of the day. Let's finish strong. I know it happens though. Hopefully things will correct themselves in time. About a minute before we start. All right, so about another minute before we begin and before we get into the class. All right, it is 2.25 on the dot. So I'm gonna give you two minutes before we actually start the lesson, hopefully give more people time to fill in. Reminder, the class time is 2.25, but y'all already know that because y'all are already here. So two minutes on the clock. In those two minutes, make sure you get down the objective. Make sure you get down the key terms and make sure you think of some of the names of some of the reform movements from yesterday. Just think of them. Just think of them. You don't need to write anything down. Don't need to type anything in. Just think of them, have them ready to go. And we are going to move forward in a little bit. I got an announcement to make. 
and then we will be all set to go. I've actually got a couple of announcements to make. About a minute and a half left. One minute, actually, no, sorry, 30 seconds. And then we'll move forward. I'll make some announcements. All right. So let's go ahead and begin. So today our main topic is going to be about the experiences of African Americans from 1800 to 1848. All right, that's our main topic right during this early Republic era. Now, before we get into that, since yesterday we didn't cover, we're gonna talk about immigration briefly, and then we're gonna get into the African American experience, the continuities and the changes of their lifetime throughout. But before I talk about that, I'm gonna talk about progress reports. So Q2 progress reports are due Friday. Now, for some of you, you're already doing everything you need to do. You're fine. But for a lot of us, we are not. So I'm letting you know now in class, in person. Now, one thing that was missing before, and I knew it for to an extent, but I didn't realize how bad it was because nobody told me I had not been uploading videos. So due to the in-person schedule and all that stuff, I don't have time to re-record videos like before, but I did upload the ones that were missing from class sessions. That's probably what I'm gonna be doing moving forward. I'm just gonna upload the class video, which has the lesson and everything exactly the same. All right, so that will be uploaded so you can get that info. So if you're somebody that relied on those videos, they're back up. And if you ever notice one is missing, you need to let me know. I only caught this because somebody let me know and I had forgotten. So I went in and fixed it. So let me know if a video is missing. They're up there. Now, for your progress report, there is a bunch of people that have not turned in the LEQ practice. This is its own standalone grade. It's worth a full grade. So if you didn't submit this, submit it. Go and make sure you hit turn in and it's submitted because some of you are doing that too. I'm grading these all week, giving feedback. And as far as missing classwork, you need to go in and work on what's in the exit ticket tab. If it's not in this tab, if it's under archives, don't worry about it. It's what's in this tab that's going on the progress report. If you have an orange flag on power school, it means the assignment's missing. That's a potential zero if it doesn't get turned in. So reach out to me on Teams if you have any questions about that, about progress reports, or about missing grades. So with that being said, we're gonna go ahead and move forward and get started. So again, first uh, topics we're gonna talk about are immigration. Let's, so let's get our notes ready. Let's get ready to go. Key point one, during this era, the earlier public era, 1800, 1848, massive waves of immigrants will come into the United States. They mainly came from Ireland, Germany, Great Britain, and China. I'll say those again, Ireland, Germany, Great Britain, and China. So I'll give you a quick two minutes so you can get that down. Again, if you have questions on progress reports or any of that, reach out to me on Teams or privately in the chat. Most of us should be fine, but there's a good number of us that have not done that. And the last date for all of those things is Friday. 
because I'm grading this week. So again, a little less than two minutes, about a minute and a half left for that first key point. Make sure you get those notes down. Got a minute left. Thirty seconds. Now for your next section of notes, what I would recommend you do, make a piece for the Irish, for the German, and for the Chinese, because that's what we're going to talk about next. Then you can make another piece and call it nativism. And we're going to talk about what all these things are briefly. It should just be a quick bullet point for each one. It's not a whole lot of writing, but it is, there are independent sections. So I would make those sections for the next 15 seconds, and then we'll get into the first topic. All right, so let's talk about the Irish. Actually, sorry, I lied. Let's talk about immigration as a whole. You don't need this first part, right? Because you know what an immigrant is, somebody that comes to the United States from somewhere else. Economic influence, that might be a heading you want to use. Uh, I'm getting a question, what about the Japanese? The other Asian countries that immigrants are coming from don't come in significant numbers. Those three groups, the Irish, German, Chinese, those are big numbers. Great Britain's another country, big numbers. Um, if you see this chart, right, you see the other countries, Japan would fall under there. Like it's, they, they come to the United States, but not in a big enough group for us to, like they're not, like not that they're not worthy of a slide, but like their contributions as a group blend in with other groups. So they, and they also don't come in significant numbers, not till later on, not till later on, especially during this time period, if you know anything about Japanese history or if you've learned a little about it in the past, they're still isolated. It's not till after the Civil War that Japan comes out as a nation. What's the era date? 1800 to 1848. 1800 to 1848. That's the bulk of what time period we're going to talk about today. Right? And Japan isn't discovered and forced onto the world stage till after the Civil War. What's happening in Japan right now? Have you ever seen the movie, The Last Samurai? That's pretty much what's going on. They're still doing the samurai feudal imperial thing. Oh, you know already. Okay, makes sense. All right, so now let's move on. So again, economic influence is what you need. And all you need for that unskilled labor, mainly from Ireland, East Asia, they worked in Northern factories or on internal improvement projects. And for this, you can just put infrastructure. So these immigrants are the ones that are gonna build the railroads, the canals and the roads that are being built during this time period. It's unskilled immigrant labor. Skilled labor came mainly from Germany. They contributed technologically and in opening businesses. Opening businesses is something I would add. And then just add in there somewhere, you don't need the, the, the heading political influence, but I would put, immigrants tended to vote Democrat. They tended to vote for guys like Jackson or Martin Van Buren. They tended to vote for those groups. So I'll give you a quick minute and a half, unskilled labor from Ireland and East Asia, working in factories or on infrastructure. The skilled labor came from Germany mainly, and it was mostly for, yeah, for, um, sorry, uh, starting businesses. And then they tended to vote Democrat. Well, so part of why immigrants tended to favor Democrats is because Democrats liked when every single poor white could vote, which is where they get their voting right from when they become citizens, right? Because they're the poorest of the poor, technically a lot of immigrant groups. That's why a lot of them tended to vote for guys like Jackson.
So that's typically the reason. It's not so much policy, but it's more like, hey, this guy, these guys say that they want us to vote, right? They're for the everyman, the common man, right? These are the common people to an extent, to an extent. We'll get into the, the nitty gritty of like, where these people voted and like which the differences between the groups and stuff later on in unit five right now we're just setting the groundwork right this is just the the stage but we will talk about more of their their specifics leaning into the wars and stuff like that and the sectionalism that'll take hold in the u.s about 30 seconds if we need more time than that let me know otherwise i'm going to move on to the irish immigrants All right, let's move on. So for the Irish, all you need to write down this first bullet point, the Irish potato famine of the 40s is the primary cause of their immigration. It's the primary reason they all came over here. They mostly settled in the Northeast and they mostly labeled in factories as unskilled workers, right? So Irish immigrants, they primarily came due to the potato famine of 1840. It's the primary cause. They mostly settled in the Northeast working in factories and then somewhere in there, make sure you know unskilled labor, right? That's what the Irish did. And they came in huge, huge numbers because of the potato famine, which was leading to starvation on massive levels, like ridiculous levels in Ireland during this time, which is why a lot of them were leaving and the place they left was the United States. So I'll give you about 90 seconds. It's kind of short. Oh yeah, it did. The potato famine is a huge deal. That potato famine literally shaped like Northeast United, the Northeast United States and a whole political climate in the US for the era. Anything Irish in the United States is probably over here because of the potato famine. Whether that's like Notre Dame fighting Irish or like shepherd's pie or like Boston Celtics. So the British or the Germans or other groups like that are just immigrating to immigrate. Lucky charms. Yeah, you're not wrong. So does that make sense, Jonathan? Like they're coming over here, St. Patrick's Day, you're right. Because like not for any particular reason, there's no huge reason that they all come. They're just coming over here for the opportunity, usually. But the Irish, they're starving to death in Ireland. And part of that is going to affect the type of people that come to the United States. So for example, on the next slide, when we talk about German immigrants, they're very different from the Irish. The Irish, it's everybody and it's usually the poor people because the rich people in Ireland aren't starving, but the poor people are. So you're gonna have poor, unskilled Irish people coming over to the United States. And when I say unskilled, I mean, they don't have a trade, right? There's no blacksmiths or butchers or business owners. It's just peasants, right? It's farm workers that don't have a farm anymore. That's what I mean by unskilled. So the only job they're suitable to do is like digging and, you know, manual labor that would be infrastructure work or working in factories because those are unskilled jobs. Now I'm going to move on and I'm going to show you German immigrants who are very different. They settled in northern states west of the Appalachians and in central Texas. Add the part about central Texas because AP graders love when you reference local stuff hey, like an hour away, not even an hour in Bernie, like there's so many German people in Bernie, New Braunfels, Schertz, all of those are German immigrant centers. And German immigrants were usually skilled laborers or people with money, Schaefer, Schaefer's, yes, you literally have a teacher that is a product of German immigration in the early 19th century, I guarantee it, somewhere down his family tree. And those Germans that came over here, they weren't peasants like the Irish. They were skilled laborers 
or they were people with money that wanted to start businesses. And I'm going to tell you a story about barbecue. Barbecue, Central Texas, like smoked brisket and stuff, that comes from German immigrants. So German immigrants are the opposite of Irish immigrants. So in New Braunfels, like that's one that's a German name. And to a lot of that stuff is German in origin. A lot of it. That's why the architecture is like that. Sausage is German. So what you need here is the, the locations and you need to put the difference right They're skilled laborers. They have money to start businesses. So I'll tell you the barbecue story, right? Barbecue, like brisket, for example, sausage. Those are all German immigrants that open up butcher shops. And when you open a butcher shop in the 1820s, when uh, you sell all the good stuff, right? Like all the steaks, all the quality cuts of meat right away. But then you're left with all the trash cuts, the, the shoulder, the, the neck, the brisket, things people don't want. And these butchers were like, I'm losing money. I'm losing product. I don't know what to do. It's just rotting here, right? There's no freezers. There's no refrigeration, things like that. So what they started to do to not lose that money, not lose that product is they would build smokers and they would smoke it. And then it would last longer. You could eat it. And if your family didn't eat it, you could sell it to people who just wanted a quick meal, right? And those are the, I'm not kidding. Those are the origins of barbecue. Central Texas, like smoked barbecue. That's where it comes from. Yes, that's really where it comes from. Now, barbecue sauce and all that stuff, that's, that's all like, that's getting over that, right? But Central Texas, like rolled oak, making briskets like that for 14 hours or smoking them all day. That comes from German immigrants. Literally, they would eat it like themselves or they would sell it to people and it would got this market. That's why barbecue cuts are unsavory cuts. They're not like creme of the creme steak cuts, right? They're not as, what would you say? They're not as good as other cuts. Not that they're bad, but back then it was the stuff nobody wanted. And now you want it because it makes really good barbecue but that's why you have to treat it a certain way. So that's where barbecue comes from. Central Texas style smoked barbecue comes from German immigrants. And typically it's German butcher shops. <laughs> but it, it's, that's where it comes from. So just so you know, now obviously like fajitas and stuff like that don't, but the, the idea of making a brisket for 14 hours with just smoke is that. You have to treat me with care. Yeah, you're probably right. So again, skilled laborers looking for business, Central Texas, Northwest, that's where Germans went. Now, Chinese immigrants. What you need for the Chinese immigrants factors, the primary uh, cause of their coming to the United States was the California gold rush. This is right at the tail end of this era, by the way. So you get an influx of mostly Chinese descendant immigrants coming because of the gold rush. Now they'll get here. <laughs> You're not wrong. So now the Chinese will get here and they'll realize, hey, actually the gold rush is kind of done. The few that do dig hardly find anything. Some do, but very few. So they mostly end up being forced to work, not forced like, uh, like slavery force, but forced to work as unskilled labor building railroads. You would not have had the transcontinental railroad built successfully without Chinese immigrants and Chinese labor. And it was a dangerous, low paying job that a lot of them did. So again, primary cause, California gold rush. What did they end up doing? Working in unskilled labor, particularly in the West, in the Western parts of the US. So I'll give you a quick minute and change for that. So yeah, German immigrants made barbecue, Chinese immigrants built the railroad. Yeah, so that image is a is a gold mine. It's an it's an attempt at a gold mine, I believe. And um, yeah, you can see how bummed out they are in that image. Um, this is a little later. This is like would have been in the meat of the gold rush. This wouldn't have been quite 40, um, 48. This would have been like 40, like mm, 49, maybe. But yeah, they a lot of them got here too late. By the way, the gold rush, like sure, a bunch of people left to California, but even if you got there early, it doesn't mean you find gold, right? A lot of gold mines end up looking like this. So it's it's not a 
don't get me wrong, a lot of them got here late. Like they would get here, you know, a couple months, a couple of years too late. And they were SOL, like there was nothing they could do about it. And they ended up having to work on railroads. But even the ones that got here on time, like it's not easy to find gold. And even if you're finding gold, everything's so expensive and it's so much to keep mining that you don't maintain, like it's very few people get rich. You need to be like the luckiest of the lucky of prospectors to even be rich. A lot of people just maintain their life for a little while and then their deposit ran out and they were done. We'll get into the gold rush when we talk about that era in Unit 5. But yeah, like stuff was super expensive over there. People that went over there to sell stuff, they knew they could sell whatever they wanted because there's nothing in between. It's crazy. Like a shovel or a pickaxe that would cost a dollar would be like 50. You're running much, Sam, maybe. I mean, even if there was another place that no one had been to that had gold, you'd have a gold rush over there because gold's still worth a lot. All right, let's move on. So this is the last thing you need. Again, you don't need it word for word. Nativism, you need the heading nativism. They are anti-immigrant. They are anti-Catholic. They are xenophobic. If you don't know what xenophobia means, I defined it for you. People that dislike people from another country, prejudice. So they are anti-immigrant, they are anti-Catholic, they are xenophobic. And then you just need to put leads to know nothing party. Leads to know nothing party. From the definitely Japanese people from this time period or from that early imperial time period, they are very nativist. Xenophobes. Is that why an alien is called a xenomorph? I don't know. You'd have to ask Ridley Scott. I have no idea. But I mean, maybe that's as good an argument as I've heard for why a xenomorph is called that. But a xenophobe is somebody that does not like people from other countries. By the way, xenophobia, the way it works, it's not about race. Now, that's not to say that nativists weren't racist. In fact, I'm pretty sure they were. But you could be the whitest, palest, most blue-eyed, red-haired Irish immigrant that ever lived. And these people still would not like you and treat you like garbage because they're xenophobes and it's about you being from another country that bothers them. So... Not to say that they weren't racist, because I don't know them. And, I, and hey, guess what? They're from the 1820s. They probably were. But it's about where you're from. So you can be white, and the nativists can still dislike you. And in fact, a lot of them did. They didn't like the German immigrants. They didn't like the Irish immigrants, because they were still immigrants. They definitely didn't like the Chinese ones. So I'll give you another minute on here to get this down. And then we'll talk about it. And then we'll move on. I'm sorry. And we'll get into the topic for today because this is from the yesterday. So we'll get into the new topic. So Isaac, I couldn't tell you about their culture now. I'm not studied up on it. I can tell you they had a period of their of their history, like in the 20th century early, where they definitely were. But you know, you could be right about today. I'd have to do the research. But there is a period where a good chunk of them were very xenophobic, yes. But again, I, I tend not to I tend not to like to generalize because there's some great people from there, right? And there's some people that are very inclusive from there. Just like there's bad people here, there's people over there that have strong beliefs too. They were mo they were located all over the US nativists. They were all over the place. Why were they called the Native American party? Because they had the audacity to call themselves Native Americans. I'm not kidding. So these whites in 1820 were calling themselves the Native Americans. How dare these immigrants show up? That's why nowadays we call them the Know Nothing Party. We had to, historians gave them their own name and it's the Know Nothing Party. Primary sources, they'll refer to themselves as the American or the Native American Party. Like that's literally what they called themselves, these names. That's why we have to call them the Know Nothing Party because it's like, no, oh, that's not at all what you are. This is their banner, Native American. And they were like, yeah, it's true. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy. It is crazy. That's why you call them the Know Nothings. Nativism, 
Nativism is what they did. A lot of countries are nativist or have nativists in them. You could argue there's nativists today. They're probably not all of these things, which is why you refer to them as like Know Nothing Party, because it's a specific group. They don't like Catholics. They don't like immigrants. They are very xenophobic. Yeah, see, you really do. And like um, some of the primary sources that these guys have where they're like, you read their artery, their art, um, wow, I just, I forgot how to speak. You read their journal entries or you read their speeches and you're just like, man, dude, you have no idea. It's, it's uh, tragic. All right. Whoa. Okay. Give me my own party. Probably could. So let's get into the next key point. Now we're going to get on today's topic. We're back to today's topic. So yesterday's is gone. We're back on today's. Um, Southern society and the Southern economy specifically heavily depended on cotton plantations and they thus heavily depended on slavery. But yeah, all you need to make a political party is a platform a set of beliefs. The sus party. <laughs> I don't know, that party sounds kind of sus, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, I don't think they put it like that quite, but they, um, yeah, they, they definitely called themselves a Native American party. They didn't realize the hypocrisy in the name. They definitely didn't know that calling themselves that was a little dumb. They were straight up serious about it. Yeah, so now we call them the Know Nothing Party. Again, another 30 seconds on here. There's a short key point, and then we're going to get into some of this stuff. We're running low on time, though, so I'm worried that we're not going to have time. So I'm going to try to blast through some of this stuff. Um, I'll give you about a minute or so on each slide. If you know that you need more time to write than that, do me a favor and be screenshotting, because I got to be strict on the time. So be screenshotting so you can write in after I'm done because we are running low on time and I wanna make sure that we have time. So let's move forward. You don't need to write anything for this slide but I want you to take a look at the chart and what do you notice changing over the years from 1800 to 1860? Start typing it in as you see it. And then as you see responses, fill it in and make sure everybody responds. What do you see? What is changing? Yes. What's the export? Yes. Yes. We'll do this for another 20 seconds. Fill it in. Even if you've seen it answered, fill it in. Yes, exporting cotton, more cotton, increase in slavery. That's on the other chart, but yes, that happens too. More cotton as time goes on, yes. All right, let's move forward. Yeah, more cotton as the years go on, more and more cotton. More and more is being exported. It's being worth more and more and everything. And a quick note that I'll make here, the huge jump in price, right, from 40 to 60, the demand is high. Cotton is increasing in price, that's a good note. So, because they export less and it's still worth more, right? That's a good note. All right, so just quick here, the distribution of slave labor, again, you're not writing any of this, 55% of all slaves in the US, and there's a lot of slaves in the US in 1850, are working in cotton. The next highest is 15% working domestically in the homes, and then these three are split evenly, 10, 10, and 10. By 1860, more than half of the US's exports total will be cotton. The U.S. produces a lot of cotton. I told you before, right? 90% of the world's cotton is produced by the United States. This is another chart I want you to take a look at, and I'm going to give you exactly 30 seconds. What are you noticing? 
Give me specific details that you notice. Go ahead and just start typing them in or coming out mute and saying them. 30 seconds. Yes. What else do you notice? Again, specific things you're noticing. I got one that there's more slaves than there are whites. What else? Free slaves in the north. The northernmost southern state, Delaware, has the most freed blacks, right? Okay. So those are all good responses. Less free blacks everywhere. The places like Texas, like Arkansas, Missouri, this is something to point out. It's not that they have zero. They don't literally have zero freed blacks living there, but there are so few freed blacks living there that they are a statistical zero. That means less than 1% of the population are freed blacks. Does that make sense? Yes, no, yes, okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and move forward from here. So slave life, what do you need to know? Why is there only an internal slave trade? What happened to the African slave trade by 1808? Someone tell me in the chat or you can come up here and say it. What happened to the African slave trade in 1808? It was abolished. Yeah, it was crumbled to ash. It was gone, right? It was gotten rid of. So the internal slave trade in the US is affected by cotton price. If the price of cotton goes up, what else? What other price is gonna go up? If the price of cotton goes up, what else is going to go up? Price what? As horrible as it is to say, I need somebody to say it. Slaves, right? So as the price of cotton is going to go up, the price of slaves will increase. The primary most expensive slaves out there were young men around 25 years of age and young women. They were the most valued. The men specifically was for their working uh, prowess. Uh, as horrible as this analogy is to make, I'm going to make it so you guys understand the you know the the practice um think of like athletes right athletes in their prime aren't 18 year old athletes but they are like the mid-20s athletes those are athletes in their prime it's the same reason that slaves at 25 are more valuable than slaves at say 18 or 19. Right? you want a slave that's in their prime so now i'm going to get into the types of labor so you don't need all of these but i would include slave drivers i would include skilled to an extent and field hands right Slave drivers are the type, or the, they were special slaves that were used to get the others to work. That's what slave drivers are. So this is a side note and I'm gonna say it quickly. If you've ever seen the movie, yeah, they regulate the other slaves. You ever seen the movie Django Unchained? Jamie Foxx is pretending to be a slave driver when he's trying to trick the other, the white guys that he's worked. It's like a slave master, he's, he runs the slaves. They're in charge of the other ones. They regulate them. That's a good way to put it, Isaac. So that's what a slave driver is. So a slave of slaves that was a slave. The slave driver is like the boss. They're in charge of the slaves that they, that they run. And they're still a slave, but they're in charge of other slaves. Their job is to keep the slaves working. Yeah, well, the Django's pretending to be a slave driver when he's in there. Yeah, they're like a manager, a regional manager. Um, don't worry about punishment. We'll talk about punishment on the next slide. So I'll give you a quick minute. It is weird. Karen's there. No, they're not Karen's. Michael Scott is there. Um, slave drivers were not very popular people, as you can imagine, and it's pretty horrible. But what else could they do? They were, they were forced. I mean, he's not that wrong. I mean, Michael Scott's not forced to do what he does, but. So again, a quick 20 seconds. All you need is the type of labor and the fact that the African slave trade is gone and it's all internal. I told you right from 1808 forward, the entire slave trade in the US is gonna be within the US. And then the types of labor they did and then we're gonna get into the punishment on the next one. Just know that part of the punishment is if slaves are doing wrong or bad or something that the masters or owners don't like, they tended to separate them, like separate families. Like, oh, you're not gonna do this? Okay, well, you know that wife of yours, I'm gonna sell you somewhere else and keep her here. They would. Um, so 
this is another messed up practice that happened, but slave workers and masters tended to pick really, what's the word, like productive slaves, slaves that were really good at work, strong ones, and they would breed them like animals to try to make stronger slaves. That's something they did. Like physically able, yeah. And they would take them and compare them. That's something that happened. That was a practice. That's why there's auctions. Like, hey, this one comes from really good stock. Like they would say stuff like that. As horrible as it is, it's what happened. And it was not good. They're built different. It's true though. Um, if you guys know who Chris Rock is, he used to have a joke about that. Like it's, there's why there's reasons we're good at sports and it's this, like, like Chris Rock makes joke, maybe we used to talk about that stuff in his, in a lot of his stand up acts. You heard that joke. He has another one that I actually really like where he's, he's portraying like a slave that's driving a stagecoach and slaves weren't allowed to read and he sees a stop sign and he does the monologue, like the internal monologue of the slave approaching the stop sign. He's like, uh Oh, what do I do? Cause if I stop, they're going to know I can read and I'm going to get in trouble. But if I don't stop, I'm going to go through the intersection. I'm going to get in, a, in an accident. It's a, it's a funny joke that you can look up later because it's not appropriate for school. But it's a, it's a funny Chris Rock joke about uh, the struggles of a slave. So their culture, really quick, anti-literacy. This is important. Look it up later. Don't look it up now. Anti-literacy. Uh, there will be a point in time where slaves will not be allowed to read anymore. So whites will not allow slaves to learn to read because they consider that dangerous. Why would it be dangerous? Come on, somebody, why would it be dangerous? Why is it dangerous to let slaves learn how to read? They will hear that they have rights. They will read their rights. If you let a slave read something like the Bible, that's where all the whites derive their rights from. Uh-uh, slaves can't have rights. They'll use the law against their owners. Good. Music is very important in slave culture and slave society. That's a, one of the few ways they'll be able to express themselves. Um, things like jazz, blues, certain types of folk, rock and roll, all have their origins in slave gathering, slave get together, slave music. It's a very popular thing and powerful thing for them. They did, and I'm not kidding when I say like rock and roll and like folk music, all sorts of stuff is influenced by them. And this, it really was punk rock. Yeah, rock and roll comes from, from what would have been slave music and then what will be like African-American black music. They probably did. Braid a map another here. Yeah, they probably did. But yeah, so marriage was not uh, legally recognized by the country and it had to be approved by the slave master and most of them were Christian. So I'll give you a quick 30, 40 seconds on that. I don't know enough about dubstep to tell you, Godric, if it was influenced by, by slave music, but I do know rock and roll was by African-American music as well. The aren't the Wiggles like a kid band? Like a little like little kid music, isn't that what the Wiggles are? All right, let's move forward. So this is just for you to see. You don't need to write any of this. These are the populations of slaves in the South by state. So 57% of the total population in South Carolina, slaves. 55, and this is in 1860, 55 in Mississippi, so on and so forth, right? Okay. Last key points, and then we've got one more slide after this, I believe. Anti-slavery efforts in the South were largely limited to unsuccessful slave rebellions. Where are all the positive, where are all the successful slave, anti-slavery movements happening? Like the abolition movement, the, or the underground railroad, where do all those start? In the North, right? Cause they have support. So in the South where there is no support for that type of stuff, you get mostly unsuccessful slave rebellions. And we'll talk about the two different ways. There's two more slides I like, where we're gonna talk about how slaves resist. There's two ways. So again, a quick, less than a minute, about 30 more seconds, this is a short one.
All right. So slave resistance for the heading, right? You, overall slave resistance. Day-to-day -day resistance, what did that mean? They pretend to be sick. They would steal certain things that were required. They would break tools. They would do a slowdown. If you don't know what a slowdown is, a slowdown is when a slow down is when you talk or work really slow. So you don't get anything done. Slow down, duh. You say that, Amy, but you'd be surprised how many people have I picked you out of, the, of a hat and said, what's a slowdown? You'd be like, oh, so I'm dramatically showing what a slowdown is, right? Slowing down so nothing gets done in the day. Sabotage, breaking things that were required. Um, why would they do these things? Typically as a group, so it would lead to negotiations, discussions. Hey, we need lunch breaks. Hey, you know, maybe we should work less hours. That didn't always happen, but that was typically the reason why. This stuff is dangerous. This isn't like breaking your pencil in class so you'd have to get up to sharpen it. You do this stuff and get caught doing it, you could be in a lot of trouble and be physically beaten and hurt. So when they did this stuff, it typically had a reason. And it was typically to negotiate with the master in some way. So I'll give you a quick time to get that down. Escaping to foreign territories or free states or stowing away on ships, underground railroad, and then the punishment, I would get some of that stuff too. Oh, Max, I didn't see your question. So not quite. Yeah, so Isaac's actually pretty much right. So most Africans during their, their time in Africa before they're brought to the US, it was very tribal, right? So they were tribal. So a lot of their religion and things like that were tribal based. But as they come to the United States, yeah, they're showing Christianity through their slave masters or through other whites. And most of these slaves, like by the time you get to this time period, the 1860s, that tribal stuff is gone, and they're all pretty much Christian. Now, pre-1830, like in the mid-1800s, like the 1800 to 1830, let's say, a lot of slaves are very Christian, and they, they really take to Christianity. It's something that they enjoy. It's not something that's forced upon them. It's something they identify with. They really like the teachings of Christianity, and there are a lot of Black churches and Black Christians around the U.S., they do see it as hope. They use it as a tool, but there is a particular thing that will happen in 1831 that we're going to talk about that makes that something that whites are reluctant to let their slaves do freely anymore. And we'll talk about it on the next slide. Again, I'll give you a quick 30-ish seconds to talk about, to get this down, and then we'll move on to the next slide, which is going to be slave rebellions. All right, so, so again, there's a couple of slave rebellions we're going to talk about. The first one, you need the name, you need the date. It was organized in part by freed Blacks in the African Methodist Church, and because of that, it was an attempt to escape to Haiti. But because the whites were able to tie it to a freed Black church, you've got restrictions on movements of freed Blacks. You've got freed Blacks needing white guardians. You've got restrictions on manumission, meaning like the different groups and how they can move around. So these are all going to lead to huge restrictions. This is in 1822. In 1831, you have Nat Turner and his rebellion. And Nat Turner in Virginia was just a religious crusade for freedom. But Nat Turner was a preacher. He was literate. He could read. He read the Bible. He taught slaves not only how to read, but how to worship. So now it prohibits literacy among slaves and freed blacks. So now, okay, y'all can't read anymore. At least there's an attempt. It's not a very good one, but it works. And black churches and religious meetings required licensed white ministers to be there. So you couldn't have 
free black assembly religion anymore. Now they did it without permission anyways, but if they're caught and some of them were, they could be punished severely for it. And I'll give you about a minute and a half to get these two down. And then we're gonna talk about the Amistad because the Amistad is a whole thing. Yes or no, have we heard of the Amistad? I'm just curious. Got one yes. Uh, so you write the names, the dates, what happened, and then you need, so you need most, you need pretty much all of it. You need to list it. You don't need everything word for word, but you need the gist of it, right? So you need, you need to write this slide. This is the last slide, by the way. But so I'll give you, I said a minute and a half, I'll give you two minutes to write this, the first two, and then we'll talk about the third one. Yes, Max, so a lot of slaves tried to escape to free states, or they tried to escape to other foreign territories that didn't have slavery, like Mexico. So like a lot of Texas slaves around the border or Arizona and stuff would probably try to escape to Mexico. Or if you're far west and there's no US in the west yet, you they would try to escape there to other countries. Canada was a big place for a lot of them. Yeah, not a lot made it, but that was a goal. especially after the Fugitive Slave Act, which we'll talk about in a little bit, in a few weeks. Okay, so now I'm gonna start talking about the Amistad. The Amistad was a slave revolt on a Spanish ship, not Mexican, Spanish. And this was in 1839. And what happened was a couple of Spanish traders went to Africa and captured some Africans, free Africans. Um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. So it was a Spanish ship that captured free Africans. It was Portuguese led um, in the, I believe the country was Sierra Leone. Now, it's taken to Cuba. Yes, the ship was. But so what happens is the ship is on its way to, I believe it is going to Cuba, and the slaves on the boat, they revolt, and they take control of the ship, and a couple of crew members escape, and they capture the captain, and I believe one or two other crew members, and they kill the rest. And the slaves are like, hey, take us back home. Well, what the captains do through sailing at night, mostly, and sneaking around, they sail to the United States instead to New York. And when they get there, the slaves are arrested. The slave owners look like they're going to get their, their people back. But then there's a bunch of abolitionists that are speaking out. Hey, you can't do this. This is wrong. Um, why are you doing this? These are free people. The African slave trade's gone. This violates international law. And this case will go to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, and the, by the way, the slaves are defended by John, or the Africans, I should say, are defended by John Quincy Adams, so former president. Um, the Supreme Court will decide that, and this is kind of a positive note, that these Africans were not slaves, that the Spanish uh, crew and captain and the Portuguese violated international slave trading law, and that these Africans were defending their rights and their freedom as free men when they took over the ship, and they will be allowed to go back home. This inspires even more people to become abolitionists. Like abolitionism rises up when they hear about this. Yeah, you're right, it, it literally increases it. And what you get as a result is that within an, a year, I think I think it's a year after the, the case, um, abolitionists around will raise up money and send the Africans that were on that boat back home. I believe they're from Sierra Leone, but I would just write down they are from Africa. This is happening in Africa. I believe it's Sierra Leone, but you'd have to double check for me on that because I'm just, I'm saying that off of memory. I believe it's Sierra Leone. From Sierra Leone, okay, Isaac's saying yeah, so I'm pretty sure that means you double checked it. So yeah, Sierra Leone is where they're supposed to be from. So I'll leave, a little, I'll leave this up a little longer. And then I'm gonna make my announcement again because there's more people in here than there were at the start of class. And then we will, I'll show you the exit ticket after. A 
about 45 seconds and then we're gonna move on. So make sure you're ready to go. All right, I'm gonna move on. So before we get to the exit ticket, so everybody should still be here, I'm gonna make this announcement one more time. Q2 progress reports are gonna be coming out Friday. So you have until Friday to get any late work that you haven't done submitted to me, All right? So exit tickets are gonna be on there. The practice LEQ is gonna be on there. Now, I know some of us rely on videos and I hadn't been putting videos. A big problem, one, just on me. I hadn't done it, that's on me. But also, nobody told me that there was a bunch of missing videos. So what I did is I uploaded everything up to yesterday and I'm gonna upload today's as well when we're done, right? And these are the class sessions. So you're gonna need to do some fast forwarding. It's the full class session though, instead of the recording. Because of the in-person schedule, I don't have time to record two lessons anymore because I'm already teaching two lessons, one in person, one virtual. So I don't like, I don't have the time of the day since I have duty and other stuff, other obligations throughout the day to record it separately. So now I'm putting up the class sessions, but if you see a video that is not there and you need one, you need to let me know at the cost. So you need to let me know that there's a video missing because if you don't let me know, I'm not gonna know if it's not up there, I clearly forgot. So let me know if a video is missing, the practice LEQ, and then for exit tickets, if you're missing something, reach out to me on Teams and let me know. But it's everything in the tab is what's going to be in there. If it's under archives, don't worry about it. Do what is in the exit ticket tab. That's going to be week two and then week three, right? So make sure these are done. Make sure the LEQ is done, wherever that is, somewhere in here. And then let me know if you have any questions, then videos should be back to being uploaded daily again. Again, if they're not, did not know there was a YouTube channel. Yeah, it's the, the link is in Teams and it's on Google Classroom as well. I put it in the, the most recent announcement on there has the link to it. So all of these, some of the first ones are recorded separately, but from now on, it'll probably be the, the class session. So that's up there for you. So now let's get into the exit ticket. All right, that exit ticket's posted. This is really brief and I'm gonna tell you something cause I'm gonna exclude something from it. So if you do it, I know it's cause you weren't listening at the end. Um, primary source, read through it, read through it carefully. Cause last time I told you identify an argument in the source, everybody missed it. Don't worry about number four. Don't hippo the document, but answer one, two and three. Number one, identify the argument. Read the passage, identify the argument. What is this person arguing about? Make sure you read it carefully and make sure you identify it correctly. Number two, identify, uh, provide one piece of evidence that supports your answer to number one. So if you tell me this argument is about why immigrants are awesome, find a piece of evidence from here that supports it. Remember, don't use direct quotes, this is an English class. And number three, find another piece of evidence that supports it. Again, no direct quotes, but say, Hammond refers to Irish immigrants as making really, really good dip called shepherd's pie, and I love them, and Irish immigrants are the best. Reference the source, but don't directly quote it. Right, so think historically, provide two pieces of evidence for what the claim is and identify the claim correctly. Do not do number four. What number aren't you doing? Four. Four. Do not answer number four. Answer one through three. You have plenty of time to answer this. Is this cotton is king? Um, Isaac, yes, it is. This is a very, uh, very true primary source. I don't censor primary sources, but oh boy, is it a is it a doozy? Oh boy, is the source a doozy? You guys are gonna read this and probably be angry afterwards because I certainly was the first time I read it, and even right now when I was making the assignment, it made me angry reading it. Classes wrote to one mil subscribers. Too many words. Jay, you can handle it. 
So that is due today. That is the exit ticket. I'll be on for the last five minutes of class if you have any questions. Otherwise, guys, that is it for me. I'm going to stop the recording somehow so I can make sure to uh, get it uploaded.